Have I written a year's worth of code since part four? No! Okay, it might not be a year's worth of code, but I've done a fair bit of housework and I'd like to quickly whiz through what I've done. Previously, it was hard coded that one block is one meter. While that was fine for our MVP, it's going to be a problem if we want to stick to our game design since we want smaller voxels. Specifically, I decided on 50 centimeter voxels for the time being, so I needed to go through my code and make the block grid size adjustable. In the beginning, I thought it would be rather easy. Ray, I think ray casting is working. Maybe it's not. What's. Okay, it's actually really fucking hard. I didn't want to do this, but I eventually just ended up implementing a whole new system of units that I could use in place of nondescript vec3s on numbers. Rust is actually really, really good for this because it not only makes it easy to add extra protections on existing types like my vec3s, but it also makes it easy to generate repetitive code using macros. Look at all of these macros. Look at the code for a single macro. Multiply the two. If I'd written all that, my fingers would have fallen off. Anyway, long story short, it's now super easy to keep track of different units like block positions, chunk positions, or meter positions. And to a certain extent, I can do maths with them and convert between them. It's not perfect, but it saved me from many issues many times. And in service of my original motivation, I can experiment with different sizes of voxel super easily now. Of course, that's not all I've done. And you've probably noticed that's not all I've done. For example, how'd I get those UI elements on the screen? In WebGPU, I set up a new render pipeline so that I could render texture triangles directly to the screen. With that, I can draw a hotbar and an offhand slot at the bottom of the screen. If I resize the window, you'll see that they scale up and down in a few steps. To calculate that scale factor, I measure the size of the screen and compare it to a small reference size which I originally used when designing the UI. If the screen can fit the reference size two times, then everything is scaled up two times. If it can fit three times, then everything is scaled up three times. By scaling things up in these whole number steps, everything just works, no matter what resolution or pixel density you're using. But that's not all, because some people have very long screens, or very tall screens. We want to make sure the UI is always comfortable to read, without requiring you to turn around just to read things at the edges of your ultra-wide monitor. To address that, I limit the aspect ratio of the screen to stay between a minimum and maximum aspect ratio. Then I just draw the UI within that aspect ratio, while letting the rest of the world fill up the whole screen. This floats the UI in the middle of your view, where it's easier to read, without taking away the peripheral vision that you paid too much money to have. So, that's the user interface stuff that I've done so far. Down the line, I'll still need to build out a proper framework for building proper UIs, but for now I'm happy with this as it is. Now, let's talk about that text you see in the corner. It's rendered entirely with my own font, and helpfully brands the game with the day, month, and year that it was compiled in. I prefer this to version numbers for archival reasons, but wait, how did I make my own font? Generally, people choose one of two routes here. Either you do what Celeste did and use full resolution fonts, or you do what I did and use a pixelated one instead. Before taking this choice for granted, let's talk a little about why you'd want to use one over the other. Using a full resolution font makes translation easier, and it can be more readable too, especially if you include dyslexia-friendly fonts like Atkinson Hyperlegible as part of your game's accessibility settings. However, full resolution fonts are also a lot more complicated to implement, because you have to do a lot of layout and rendering work, so for the time being, I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm sticking to pixel fonts, because I already know how to work with those, seeing as I've written multiple pixel font renderers over the years. The first step in our pixel font journey involves drawing all the letters. For Project Stockholm's font, I'm using NeoVoxic, which as the name implies, is a new version of Voxic, my previous pixel font that I used in previous projects. The big change of NeoVoxic is that, even though it's a pixel font, it's actually designed at full resolution with vector software. This not only gives it a nice new anti-alias look, but it's also a bit more future-proof because I could turn it into a full resolution font if I wanted to. But that's not all. NeoVoxic also has wider 12 pixel line spacing up from eight pixels in the original Voxic. This means that many letters can adopt their natural size rather than being squished. That's especially important for things like descenders or diacritics. Finally, I slightly changed the style of the font too. I added a few more dips and rounded strokes of the font to make it look a hint more calligraphic, almost like handwriting. However, I didn't take that too far because I wanted to preserve the geometric bones of the font, but I think it still looks quite nice. Anyway, once I designed the whole set, I could then use Figma's handy auto layout to pack all the letters together into a 128 by 128 texture 
could be used in game. I also rendered the bounding boxes of each letter and wrote all of the letters that I drew into a text file. I quickly wrote a program to combine these things into a single machine readable file, letting me easily access the position and size of any letter that I wanted. Over in the game, all I need to do is load in the texture, load in the data, and then I can render out any text I'd like by going through the characters one by one and drawing a rectangle on the screen with the correct position, size, and subsection of the texture. There's some special handling for spaces, tabs, and line breaks, but nothing special. Simple. Oh, and by the way, I'm using very specific measurements in my code. For example, when I render some text at a position, that position represents the top left corner of a capital letter, not the top left corner of the whole text passage. In a similar fashion, I measure the size of text using the height of a capital letter. So why am I using capital letters in all of my measurements? Why not just use the size of the texture? Well, simply put, Look at these dangly bits! We need space in the texture to represent them, but that space is visually outside of the line. So to make it easier to deal with text position and text size, I do all my measurements assuming the height of a line of text looks similar to the height of a capital letter. The dangly bits can poke out above and below, but fundamentally they shouldn't affect any layout computations. All right, so that's how fonts work. Now let's talk about that subtle vignette that you might have noticed on top of the game, which you might be surprised to hear is not just a gradient texture. In fact, the vignette is an example of a post-processing effect, essentially a shader that runs on every single pixel after all the 3D rendering is done. That might sound simple, but actually implementing it is a little bit of a headache. Pretty much, instead of rendering the 3D graphics to the screen, I now have to create a new camera texture which I can render into. Then I tell all the 3D stuff to render into the camera texture rather than rendering directly to the screen. Once all of that is done, I can finally draw a big triangle on the screen which will show the actual camera texture in the game window. Because I'm drawing it in a triangle, I can use the fragment shader to do whatever maths I feel like doing. For the time being, I just rendered that vignette, but in the future, I could do a whole bunch of things like blurs or fog or even hint hint, I can compress HDR colors into a format that your screen can display. How exciting. For the time being though, I just wanted to make sure I had the system up and running before I entrench myself too deeply in my design decisions. There's a few other things I've done, like reworking some of the physics to be more realistic, fixing some rounding errors in the ray casting code, and making sure you can't place blocks inside your own collision box, but none of that stuff is particularly interesting, so let's move on and implement something new together. Up until this point, I pretty much just tested things on the pre-generated bit of flat terrain because it wasn't particularly important. However, we're getting to the point where it'd be useful to have chunks load in and out of our world, so we'll need to implement a system that loads chunks around a player as they move. Our first consideration then is that it might take a while to generate a chunk. I mean, sure, right now it's just flat terrain, but what if it was a complicated terrain generation algorithm, or what if it was reading a file from a slow hard drive? To deal with that, we'll need chunk generation to happen in the background while other game systems are running. The first thing that means is that our game needs to handle chunks that exist but haven't finished loading yet. Instead of directly storing chunks in our world, I instead store an enum with the state of the chunk. Chunk states can either be pending, meaning it's still being generated, or they can be available, at which point we can access the chunk inside. From there, it's just a matter of updating the rest of the code to deal with this new enum, rather than just assuming chunks exist. Rust has really fantastic pattern matching, which makes this super easy and most code at this stage can just ignore unavailable chunks. Next up, we'll need a mechanism for quickly finding nearby chunks to load and unload. You could just go over every single chunk with a for loop, but because I'm very wrinkly brained, I reused a better algorithm I wrote for my older voxel engine that spirals outwards in 3D starting from a central location. That should make it easier and faster to prioritize nearby unloaded chunks because they will appear sooner in the list. With all that in place, we can start discovering chunks. To do that, we need to periodically check around the player to see what needs to be loaded. However, that also means we'll have to be quick because the game tick has to do other things. So instead of actually doing any loading, we'll create a list of instructions and send them to another thread that runs in the background. While we're at it, we'll also mark those chunks as pending so the rest of the code base knows that we're working on them. Finally, on the next tick, before making the next set of instructions, we can ask the background thread for any chunks it's finished working on and add them into the world. That's all we need to do as part of the game tick, so it should be pretty fast. Let's think about that background thread now. There's actually a whole bunch of them, so the specific thread we just sent the instructions to is known as the feeder thread. Its job is to continually feed incoming instructions to any idle worker threads. The worker threads are completely dedicated to chunk generation. They'll wait for a chunk position to come in, then they'll create that chunk and fill it with blocks. Once they're done, they send a message to the return thread with both the completed chunk and the ID of that worker. The return thread will send on the completed chunk so that it can be included in the next game tick. Then it will send 
send the worker ID over to the feeder thread so that the worker can be kept busy with another task. All of those threads run in super tight loops, so the chunks will be generated as fast as your computer can calculate them, with minimal downtime. It's completely separate from the rest of the game loops too, so it will stay fast even if something is slowing down the rendering or the game ticks. In fact, it's so fast that the entire world now loads in a single tick. That's thousands of chunks in under 16 milliseconds. The only problem, it's so amazingly fast and efficient that our rendering code can't keep up anymore. So it should be pretty fast. Even though it only takes a fraction of a millisecond to generate a chunk mesh, it still can't handle generating thousands of chunk meshes at full frame rate. I'm gonna go away and work on that, and it's going to involve some super interesting GPU tech, but while I'm doing that, why not watch this video where I explain the current system for generating chunk meshes.